Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you are the Holy God, Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we just bless, pray that you bless us as we look at your word for these moments this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. How many of you walked in here by your own power this morning? A few of you, okay? So what I need this morning to help me with my opening illustration is I need someone at each corner of the auditorium, one at the back over here, one over here, one here, and one here that can walk, okay? And I just want you to start walking around the auditorium for me, okay? Matt is already up at the back there, so Matt, if you go over to that corner there, uh, okay, we got Brian, Brian, you stay there, Matt's coming up to the front, all right, and I just need two people over here. Thank you, Derek, and uh, um, oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. So we have four guys this morning that can walk. So what I'd like you to do, just start walking around the perim perimeter. This is not a race. None of you look like race walkers to me at all, but you can tell a lot from someone's walk. Did you know that? In fact, there's been a hundred years of study on people walking and what makes them walk. So human movement is the fascinating interplay of coordinated actions. Did you know that? And when we observe someone walking, you're witnessing a complex series of movements, each with its own timing and path, walking my friends, is more than just a mundane activity to get from point A to point B. It's a superpower, as they say, that unlocks the cognitive prowess of our brains like nothing else. Did you know that when you walk, you get a brain boost? Okay? These guys are smarter now than they were before <laughs> as a result of that. There's also structural changes that are happening Studies reveal that walking can mobilize changes in the brain structure. It increases volume in areas associated with learning and memory. As they walk this morning and then as they sit down, they will be continually learning as a result of this this morning. There's also efficient mechanics. When we walk, our bodies act like inverted pendulums. At least one foot is always touching the ground, as you can see, right? There's a rhythmic regulation, too. Walking is inherently rhythmic, mimicking our own heartbeat as we pound the pavement. Our nervous system finds emotional safety with walking. There's also cardiovascular benefits. Walking is a type of cardiovascular exercise that gets our hearts really pumping and our whole body pumping. So every step you take is a step towards better health and energy. Now, guys, just stop for a moment. Now, I want you to start walking like this. Okay? With a bit of a, a big limp. Okay? Okay? Now, why do people walk like this? Because they sat too long with their phone in the bathroom. That's why. Okay, hey, you guys can sit down. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. People have a certain gait when they stroll down the street. You can recognize certain people walking down the street. If you know them well enough, you go, oh, that's so-and-so. I know their walk. I know their walk. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. And uh, in the notes that you can download from our website, where you can take additional notes to the notes I've given you, you'll see there I included both kind of translations that I use, the ESV and the NIV. And the ESV reads it this way, Colossians chapter 2, uh, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord... So walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. The NIV says, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. 
Uh, I think it, it kind of conveys that this continue to walk in Christ, rooted and build up in him, strengthen in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. These two verses this morning, along with the closely related uh, verses 8 to 15 of chapter 2, is really at the heart of Colossians. In these two verses, Paul succinctly summarizes the basic response that he wants from his readers. Paul ties these verses to their context by reflecting language and ideas found earlier in the letter. And this positive exhortation to continue to live in Christ or to continue to walk in Christ is elaborated in a series of four participles here in verses 6 to 7. And it's also very familiar what Paul talks about in verses 10 to 12 as well of chapter 1. And there's a warning about avoiding false teachers, and we will get to that in the next couple of weeks, and Tyler will be preaching next week. But this first clause succinctly restates the key theological argument of the letter to this point, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and when we have trusted in Jesus Christ, we have moved into a lordship relationship with him. The second clause then summarizes the specific commands and warnings that follow and that we are to continue to live in him or continue to walk with him to work out what it means in both our thinking and our acting to live under the lordship of Christ. So the main idea of verses 6 and 7 is just very clear. Continue to live your lives with Jesus as Lord. Continue to live your lives with Jesus as Lord. The great uh, pastor and writer A.W. Tozer uh, said, There is no saviorhood without lordship. And when we hear the word Lord, we, we need to understand it in the context that Jesus is our, to be our not only our savior, but the Lord of our life, the master the leader, the boss of our life in all aspects of our life if we truly been saved by Jesus Christ. So first of all, he says, be walking with Christ, to walk. And we've seen a vivid illustration of that this morning. I don't know how many of you like to walk, but I do. I was out this morning with uh, my grand dog, uh, Frank, is staying with us for a week while my kids are away. And so I took Frank out for a walk this morning, then I came back and walked my dog, Chloe. And I'm out walking this morning, and not a lot of people are out early Sunday morning. But there I was out walking, and, and as I get through that, that walk, I'm just thankful for the fresh air and everything that, that happens in a walk. But we are to be walking with Christ, or to continue to live in Him, And it's stated in the imperative mood, asserting the behavior is necessary so that we can grow in our walk with Jesus Christ. Among Aboriginal people in Australia, the males go on a walkabout as part of their rite of passage into manhood. They travel alone across their territory to become familiar with it and thus a part of it. And the Greek word here, peripateo, literally means to walk about, uh, to live out your life, but you're walking with Jesus Christ. And in a sense, what Paul is saying here, we're to walk about in him when we become familiar with him and are a part of him. Jesus Christ is Lord is a way of saying that he is the image of the invisible God, as we saw the firstborn of all creation, the head of the body, the church, the the mystery of God is Jesus Christ, and he is the one that contains all wisdom and knowledge. And this is the central confession that, that Paul wants us to understand, Jesus is Lord. Now, believers can avoid the deception of verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. But it's important for us to understand that when we've received Jesus Christ, 
we receive him as Lord, and now we are to continue to live with him as our Lord. And the proof of someone that, ha that has trusted in Jesus Christ, repented of their sin, and turned to him by faith is that they continue throughout the rest of their life to live uh, as a follower of Jesus Christ where he is Lord of everything in our life. This word live literally means walk. It's a step-by-step, -step, a day-by-day -day, uh, relationship where we conduct our life in a submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. This week I, I heard a, an incredible illustration. And uh, it's told by a rancher and his son and they were working on a fence on their ranch when all of a sudden... Coming towards the fence was a buck and uh, huge antlers, but they realized that this buck was attached to another buck that had been fighting, and that other buck had died in the fight. Okay, for all you animal lovers out there, I, this is graphic today, but I need this illustration. And, and, and what happened was that that buck who was, had been dragging this other buck for a little while, they could tell, let's just say. And so finally, the buck who was alive kind of collapsed under the weight, and they were able to go over with their shovels and untangle the buck. In a couple of minutes, the buck that was alive got up, started walking away in great freedom, shaking its head, wondering what had happened, and then all of a sudden, it had gone about 25 yards, it decided to come back and start fighting the dead buck again. <laughs> and the rancher and his son chased it off, and they buried the other buck. Too many of us have been fighting against the things of God, and as a result, we've been carrying around a lot of dead things in our life. But when Christ comes into our life, he sets us free from those dead things in our life to give us freedom and life. But what Paul wants the Colossians to understand is that when you have this freedom in Christ, you're to continue to live in him. Don't go back to the old lifestyle, to the things that are going to bring death to your life rather than life and freedom. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. That's what happens when we come to know Christ. And God says, I will live with them and walk among them and be their God, and they will be my people. What a marked relationship that is. It's incredible. And in Galatians chapter 5, we Verses 16 to 26, we see the contrast between those who are living the Spirit-filled life and those that are still living in darkness. And no longer we are to live in darkness as we're living the Spirit-filled life. We're to walk in the way of love. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 2. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In fact, when you look at in Colossians chapter 3 and, and verse 7, it, it just says there, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as anger, rage, ma malice, slander, filthy language from your, your lips, and etc. And, and, and we are to live differently. We're not to fall into those traps anymore because if we claim to have fellowship with Jesus Christ, we are not to walk in darkness, John says in 1 John 1, verse 6. We lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ, his son, purifies us from all sin. So we don't have to be pulling around a lot of dead stuff in our life. We can be set free in Jesus Christ. And John says in 2 John 1 verses 4 and 6 it has given me great joy to see find some of your children walking in the truth just as the father commanded us 
And, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. It's almost, here's the picture that Paul wants us to understand, that if we truly are with Christ, we are focused on him and walking with him in a direction that is holiness and godliness and spirit-filled. But we as a Christian can even fall away from that where basically what happens is that we're maybe walking with Christ and then all of a sudden we go, oh, that looks really good over there. And we take a detour. And some of those detours are very destructive because the, the, the devil always has detours, <laughs> even for the Christian. But we can also be someone else who maybe has heard the gospel of Christ but it's turned away, and, and basically we're just walking in our own way until something drastic happens where God basically does something in our life to turn us around and get us refocused back on the one who gives us life and freedom in him. Compromise is a, is a very disastrous thing, but when we are committed to Jesus Christ, when we understand how important that is, we're like King David. He was committed to God, and he followed God. Even through the disastrous things where he compromised in his life, he kept turning back to God. But those who are compromising, you wonder at times, are they really Christ or not? And Solomon, his son, was a compromiser for a long time. He kind of knew the things of God, but he just continued to live a life of compromise, spiritual compromise, and there was disastrous things that happened as a result. Most people think he turned back to God later in his life, but as a result of his compromising as a parent and even as a king, his son Rehoboam was in conflict. He didn't even know God because he had a compromising father. One of the things that we need to understand, even as parents, is that we need to be so committed to Christ. We, we need to be totally committed to Christ, following Christ, obeying Christ, so that our children see, and even our grandchildren see, that this is the way to go. This is the way that Jesus leads us. Because if we compromise we, we mostly produce children, grandchildren who are in conflict. They do, don't know the Lord because they have not seen the example of a committed follower of Christ. Why does Paul say this? Well, he says, first of all, be rooted in Christ. Here's the picture of a tree. And, and right away, when I looked at this verse and looked at the word there, it just drew me back to Psalm 1. <laughs> And there in Psalm 1, we say, we hear this, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers not so the wicked they are like chaff that the wind blows away therefore the wicked will stand will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous for the lord watches over the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish paul's talking here about being rooted in christ steady progress is possible when we're grounded or rooted. Christians are not to be tumbleweeds with no roots, blown about by every wind of doctrine. Well, we, oh, they, they sound good over there, or they sound good over there. No, it's what does this word say? And what does the Spirit of God say? Because the Spirit of God always agrees with the Word of God, and the Word of God always agrees with the Spirit's direction in our life. The two are not divided. And, and so Paul says, be rooted in Christ. And we avoid this kind of tumbleweed Christianity when we're firmly rooted in Jesus Christ. Roots don't exist for themselves. They exist 
to give the plant strength and to help the plant grow, we are to be rooted. But notice something else he says here. Be built up in Christ. This is the the picture of a building and that we are to be continually built up or edified, built up, not torn down. Others can tear us up or tear us down. We can also sabotage our spiritual lives by sin and falling back into old habits. But Paul says, be built up in Christ here and be continually to be built up. As we continually walk with Christ, we're continually rooted in Christ, and then we are built up in Christ as well. And notice what uh, one of the verses that I put into this uh, particular point was 2 Corinthians 13.10. It says, this is why I write these things when I'm absent, that when I come I may not have to be harsh and use up my authority. The authority God, the Lord gave me for building you up, not tearing you down. And Paul continues that theme in Ephesians chapter four because he says, from the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Notice something about this. Paul didn't say that we are to live our life, Christian lives in isolation from one another. He says that every part has to be there together. It's more like a forest. Trees uh, together are stronger than one tree out in a field somewhere. And that's the picture that he wants to, to paint for us here. But notice the next, next thing he says, that be strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Be strengthened by faith in Christ. Here's the picture of exercise. This is the picture of exercise. I mean, if you want to be a good walker, you need to practice walking, right? Some of you need to get outside this afternoon. Get some fresh air. Slip on the sidewalk. Just have fun, right? (laughs) Get out and walk, right? But it's, but it's exercise that we need. But we also have to exercise our faith. I mean, 2 Peter 1, verses 5 to 10 says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and mutual affection love. I mean, as you're walking and praying, Each day, you can just concentrate, Lord, what do I need to add to my faith? Oh, today I'm going to just pray for a greater goodness in my life, or greater knowledge in my life, a greater godliness in my life. That means walking with God in holiness. Lord, help me to have a greater love for those around me. Uh, We are to be strengthened by faith, exercise our faith, so that we are rooted, built up, and strengthened. And we are to grow. But how are we to grow? We are to grow in faith as we were taught. We have no need to seek secret or higher knowledge from from those who, who are on the internet. We are to grow in the knowledge of the truth already revealed in Jesus Christ. What's your next step in your faith journey with Christ? Maybe you need to take some time just to think about that and pray about that and ask God, what, what's my next step with you? Maybe you've trusted Christ, but you've never gone public with your faith in baptism. We're planning some baptismal services, and, and maybe you have questions about that, but what is your next step of faith? Yeah, you, you've believed in Christ, but we see the biblical outline for us if we are to keep growing in Christ to believe in Christ, be baptized in Christ, belong to the church in Christ, be a part of a community of believers. And as a result of that, and that God's working in our life, we are to behave like Jesus, become more and more like him. And as a result of being like Jesus and growing in him, we are to break out in ministry like Jesus to those around us. Colossians chapter 1 verse 11 mentions this again too. It says, being strengthened, the same Greek word is used there, with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience 
and joyfully give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. We are to be strengthened. We are to stay away from strange teachings that are out there. Hebrews 13.9 says, Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings, It is good for our hearts, and the the same word is used here, strengthened by grace, um, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is no benefit to those who do so. Because the movement that Paul was up against said, you got to eat a certain way in order to please God. you got to do this, 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 and this. And when you are finding someone who's teaching that it's just a bunch of human rules, or some mystery that they say, and you hear this all the time to get you to bite on something online, this is the mystery, I have the secret for you, I have the five secrets that are going to change your life. No, the mystery is Jesus Christ, as we saw last week. It's him. In the notes, I put a quote in from Max Anders in his excellent uh, commentary on Galatians and Colossians, he said this, um, we are to not only to listen and obey the teaching of Christ, we're also to overflow with thankfulness. Those two are the markers of someone who's continuing to walk with Jesus as Lord. To listen and obey the teaching of Christ. I mean, 1 John 2, 6 says, whoever claims to live in him must walk or live as Jesus did. Or as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Paul says it very clearly. If you're going to follow anyone, they better be following Jesus Christ. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You might be able to walk physically, But if you're not walking with Christ, whatever you're doing is nothing. Because in his strength, in him alone, do we, are are we able rather to, to do things that have an eternal impact because we're following Christ. And we're learn, we have to learn to listen to the Spirit of God, the teaching of the biblical apostles. We have so many people today claiming that they're apostles or they're prophets. When the prophets and the true apostles in the scriptures give all of us the truth we need to walk in victory in Jesus Christ. This is the danger that's happening, especially in North America uh, churches where people are believing that they're the apostles now and they are the prophets now. But instead, we are to listen and obey the teaching of Christ because he is our priest, prophet, and king. We need to listen to him. And notice he says, overflowing with thankfulness. After all that, here's the quote from Max Anders. This comes when we recognize that we are complete in Christ. That we have every opportunity to grow spiritually in him. A thankful believer is not easily led away from Christ. A discontented, grumbling, whiny believer, however, will be easy prey for false teachers who are more than willing to offer just what you've been missing. Paul brings us back. Are you stuck spiritually this morning? Do you find yourself very critical of others or grumpy? Maybe whiny? Are you walking in commitment to Christ, or are you walking in compromise? You've been turning away from the things of God. Or maybe you're here today and you're in conflict. You do not even know Jesus Christ yet. And yet you're you're, you're trying to live your life in your own power, in your own strength, and it just isn't working. Commitment is focused on Jesus Christ and following hard after him. Compromise is kind of saying, well, just wait a minute, Jesus. This looks good. This sounds great. Isn't this a shortcut? And we fall back into sin, much like Solomon did over and over again. And then there are those in conflict who don't know the Lord like Rehoboam. See, the main idea and the main thrust 
of the book of Colossians is just very clear. Continue to live your lives with Jesus Christ as Lord. Continue to live your lives as Jesus Christ is Lord. Today, you can trust Christ if you're in conflict. You don't know him. And, and Christ's invitation is still the same, to come follow him. That we repent of our sin and turn to him by faith and invite him into our life. And if the Holy Spirit has been working on your heart lately, maybe it's time today that salvation comes to your life through Jesus Christ and you trust him as the Lord and Savior of your life. But if you're a Christian living in compromise, it's time to repent and turn away from what's been happening and to turn to being a, a committed Christian that, that right away you're, you're heading the way Jesus wants you to live because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. And as a result of making that commitment to Christ, the proof of that commitment is that you're continuing to walk with Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. That He's the boss, He's the leader, He's the master of every aspect of your life. And as you grow in him, he will just cut, keep tapping you on the shoulder. Hey, this, you need to surrender this to me. You need to keep following me. Uh, don't, don't drift this way. Continue this way. And as you and I yield day by day, moment by moment to the Spirit of God, God gives us the strength and the filling of the Holy Spirit of God so that we walk with him closely, very closely. Now, Gwen doesn't get up early in the morning to walk the dog with me, but I like going for walks with her. And I like going and where we can just be hand in hand, right? The picture I have when walking with Jesus is, is yes, hand in hand, but I also see him kind of having his arm around me like this, and he's pointing the direction in the way I should go. And that, like walking with Gwen, is such an enjoyment in my life. Sensing his presence, listening to his voice, reading his word, being prompted by the Spirit of God, growing in that each day so that our lives just continue to walk with Jesus. It's an intimate relationship that we can have with him. That's what he wants more than anything. I always think of the disciples who had all that time with Jesus up in those hills, walking those rocky paths, listening to his voice, and then some of them getting to write all about him and what he's done. Jesus Christ, his message to us today is that we continue to live in him as Lord of our life. Let's pray. For some of us here today, Father, this message might be new. It might be one we haven't heard for a long time. But, Lord, you are calling us to repent of sin and turn to you by faith so that you are the Lord, the leader, master, boss of our life. Lord, too many of us have been trying to live our life on our own. And I pray, Father, today that your Holy Spirit would just move in people's hearts today, that we would take the next step, whether it's just trusting you, first of all, Maybe it is baptism. Maybe it's being part of a local church. Lord, maybe there's an issue at, in our home that we have to deal with. Maybe it's some sinful habit that keeps holding us back where we need to yield to you once and for all and to stop it in Jesus' name. Father, you know each of our hearts today, and I just invite your Holy Spirit to Touch our hearts and minds today, Father, and that we would yield to you, submit to you, surrender to you, whatever it might be, so that we can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and continue 
to live day by day, moment by moment, with Jesus as Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us this scripture today. In Jesus' name, amen.